Hi everyone, welcome to the new system design video on event-driven architecture. So as you can see, we have a set of services with us. The main difference between request response and event-driven architecture is that you have requests sent by clients to our gateway services. But internally what happens is, these services never interact with each other directly. Instead, they use events to state that yes, something has changed. So if a service is sending an event to the event bus, it's basically saying something has happened which it concerns me and if it concerns anyone else, you can consume this event. So all interested consumers, which can be called subscribers and this can be called the producer, consume this event and see if this event is relevant to them. After that, they might create events themselves because their internal state might change. So on and so forth down this tree up to this service which might be sending an email to another client. Now I kept this email bit because it gets interesting with this. For now just remember that this is very similar to publisher subscriber with some subtle differences coming in after some time once I explain what the applications are because looking at these architectures you might wonder why would I ever use this. The most popular event driven architecture that I can think of is Git. Git uses events which are like commits to get its way through its history. There's React, which is if you're a JavaScript fan, then React is something that you probably know about. Node.js, if you're on the server side, and many gaming systems also use event-driven architecture. Speaking of games, there's a really interesting use case where event-driven architectures come into play. Let's say you are the first player, and there's a second player, and there's the server in between. And these are your timelines. So in a first-person shooter game like Counter-Strike, you know about the headshots that we can take. Let's say you, you look at a person and you're at this point and you click your, your headshot. So this information goes to the server. The server then figures out where player 2 exists and maybe player 2 is at position 10. And while you take, took the headshot, you saw the player at position 9. After evaluating whether it's a headshot or not, which it is not, the server says, no, this is not a headshot. But the thing is, at this point in time, t, maybe 2 was at position 9. So if 2 was at position 9, this should have given a headshot to 2 and you should have won the game. But instead what has happened is because we had a delayed response, maybe 2 moved to position 10, told that to the server and the server has updated its position because of this movement. But that's not fair because you know you took the headshot when the player was at position 9 and you're getting position 10. You want headshots. So what you can do here is as the server take these new movements or shots as events and when you have an event driven architecture this is quite easy. You just take the event, you take the timestamp, whenever required you can move back that is one way you can undo or you can replicate all the events that you had up to this point. You know, you'll pass a timestamp of let's say 50 and you just move 50 events forward. Check this state. If player 2 has a, is at position 9, then you call that a headshot and you win the game. In a system design question though, there's very specific areas where you might find event-driven architecture useful. If you're not able to get the event-driven architecture working, you know, quickly enough or if it's, if it's not fitting into the model, don't pursue it and we'll get back to this in some time, the reason why it's not, it's not very flexible. So as you can see, there's a lot of places where event-driven architecture can come into play. The workings of this thing are explained right now. So let's say this is service 1, service 2, service 3 and service 4. So service 1 gets a request, it sends an event over here, it's in the event bus. Now when service 2 gets this event, it actually stores that event in its own local database. And this is one of the important things about event-driven architecture. Each of the services stores the data it's getting from this event bus. It's not compulsory necessarily. I mean, uh, it can be a single store of data also. The event bus can store all the data, but you usually want to pass this persistence requirement to the services which are actually consuming this event. Because then the event bus can be free, it can get rid of the events. It doesn't even need to take care of persisting them in the right way. The service can store these events 
by adding additional fields which are relevant to it or maybe removing some of the fields which are not relevant to it but it stores them in the local database and so even if this service is not working the second service doesn't need to ask relevant information every time so this is a little different from the standard microservice architecture that we have where all the services store data only relevant to them here you're storing data which is relevant to you but also coming from other services so the database is actually storing event information now what are the advantages of this one like we said is availability even if some service goes down you don't need to ask it for relevant events so you are available although with high availability comes one straight off problem which is consistency so if the data here has changed like over here uh, then this data needs to get updated according to this data that usually doesn't happen and that's why consistency is not so good consistency is simply all of your data across all of your services being the same that is consistent and this won't be consistent what other good thing can be done by just storing all the events so if you have something like the event log which is basically what your database is doing it's logging all of the events you can actually move to any point in history using this event log so going from the start to a particular point is very easy you just run the events one by one and you are at that state so if you have any bug in your code which you know came after timestamp t just go to that timestamp t run one event one by one and you can actually debug it even for a production system so that's a big advantage of event driven architecture let's say you write a new service service 5 which needs to replace service 2 it's very easy all you need to do is ask the event bus to send you all the new events before that you take all the events from timestamp 0 to timestamp whatever is the current timestamp replay these events into this service uh, and service 5 will be consistent with service 2 then and then you have already accepted the newer events and this service will be online so it can replace service 2 very easily it's a smooth replacement instead of the clunky bits that we have in uh, in non event driven architectures okay two more advantages of this uh, the first one is that it gives you a transactional guarantee messages when sent to any service are either at least one or at most one in this architecture so if it is at most one then you send a message and you don't care if it reaches or not if it doesn't reach it's fine maybe sending the email is not so important so at most one might be a welcome email on the other hand if it's an invoice email you want it to be sent definitely so that is at least one in which case you will be retrying your event bus logic in case the service doesn't get it try again try again but definitely send the email at least once so it's giving you that kind of transaction guarantee and finally when you're storing these events which are which is basically relevant data to you you are also storing the intent of the event so why did you change that data now because of this tomorrow if you have a new service you can actually look at the intent of the data and make changes in your code such that you have a completely different state in your service file finally it will be storing all the events of course but the actions it performs depends on the events only so if you have all the events logged with you you can actually do different actions compared to service 2 enough of the advantages now let's get to the disadvantages service 4 is a point of interest it's sending emails to external services and in this event driven architecture you might think that i can replace service 4 just like i replace service 2 but we can't because when we are sending emails we are dependent on responses from external systems and if that response is dependent on time then when we are trying to actually replace this service by replaying all the events those events will get different responses so its behavior will change without us actually wanting it to that's one major issue uh, with event driven architectures all the services on the gateway will need to be storing the timestamp of the responses sometimes that's okay but sometimes the responses are entirely dependent on our time uh, and you know storing the timestamp and the response doesn't make any sense sometimes another thing is it's not it's not giving you too much control whenever we are sending 
an event to the event bus and it's sending it to service 2 or service 3. We really don't have that fine-tuned control of a request and a response. With a request and a response, we can clearly mention how much time the request should take, exactly the service we want to send it to. With this, it's dependent on the event bus and even if you can mention to the event bus in how many seconds it should be done, that event might not come into the queue till quite some time. And if you have to get over that, then you have to set priorities, things are getting complicated. Because we cannot fine tune the, the handling of these events, what should be an event? If there's any internal state which has changed for me and I publish that all the time as an event, maybe that's a security issue. Maybe I don't want that data published outside. With an event bus architecture, it's difficult to know what people want to consume and what people don't want to consume. The problem with this also is that maybe you want some services to consume your events and you want to stop some other services from ever touching your events. That brings an additional layer of complexity to the event bus. I'm not saying that it's impossible, it's just really difficult to do this. Another disadvantage is that if it's storing all the events one by one and you need to get to a particular point sometimes, uh, there's only three ways. The first one is to replay from start. Now this is replaying the entire system. Uh, of course, it's completely impractical for many of the systems because there's too many events that you need to process. The second one is diff based, in which case you take the first event and then just store the diffs. And the third one is to use something like an undo. So this is really cool. You can undo up to a particular point, but some operations can be undone, some operations cannot be undone. Like subtractions and additions, yeah, you can, you can undo them. But uh, there are some operations which you cannot undo. Like for example, sending an email. One way that you can get rid of it is to squash all events. So compaction, every maybe day or two days or three days, you can compact all the events up to a particular day instead of up to a particular timestamp. So that will really help the system because you can roll to that point. So diff based or then replay is also going to work. So that's just a disadvantage which can be overcome. So it's not really so much of a disadvantage. By now you might be feeling a little apprehensive about using this architecture. So I'll give you two more disadvantages. Both of them are developer disadvantages that software teams feel. The first one is that it's difficult to reason about the flow of this system. When you look at service one, service one is just publishing to an event bus, but then that's where it code stops. Looking at service one's code, you can just figure out that, yeah, it publishes to an event bus, but you don't know what happens with that event. So you have to go to the event bus and see what are the subscribers for this event. So the flow of the program is not easy to understand. That's a major problem with uh, designing these kind of systems. The developers will not be look, able to look into the code and figure out where the things are going. The second thing is it's difficult to move out of. So if you have this kind of architecture and you suddenly want some part of it to be a request response architecture, it's not so easy. Because everything is an event, you're going to be consuming that and then passing that forward. If you send it as a request to one of the event buses, it is possible, but it's, it's not going to fit very well. In conclusion, we can think of services in event-driven architectures to be having some sort of a log of their events and using a publisher subscriber model to pass and consume those events. A good way to actually remember all the advantages and disadvantages of this is to think of what event-driven architectures are. All the services in an event-driven architecture, they publish events when they feel like someone needs to know something. So they publish an event. While in a request response, the service asks for some, something. So that might be data, it might be a service. That's the primary difference between these two architectures and almost all of the advantages and the disadvantages come from this subtle point. Like I said, a lot of systems actually use this architecture. Smalltalk and Git, I think, are the oldest ones which use this, while React and Node.js are the popular new ones which use this architecture. If you want to have a discussion on all those things, then we can have them in the comments below. If you want to subscribe for further videos similar to this, please press the subscribe button and you can always like the video, of course. I'll catch you next time.